Welcome back. Today we are going to start a new unit and this one will be on transport, okay? And specifically mass transport because we have indeed looked at heat transport in the context of thermomechanics. We begin today studying mass transport. And you will recall that at the very beginning of the series of lectures, when we sort of sketched out the plan to study continuum physics, we talked about studying the mechanics of solids and fluids. We said we'd look a little bit at um, heat conduction, which was in the context of thermomechanics, and we also included mass transport. Okay, so now we've come around to that um, last of four topics that we initially listed. Okay, so um, let's put down the, the basis, right? So we are uh, continuing to look at uh, continuum bodies. So we have our basis. and we have our configuration. Now, an important difference that I am going to uh, adopt in our treatment of mass transport is that we are actually going to leave the mechanics out of it. So we are not considering the deformation of bodies, okay? What that means is that uh, I need to use this as my basis today because I've forgotten to bring in my uh, Lego vectors, so I'm using the Allen keys, right? So uh, E1, E2, E3, right? We have our basis and our continuum body. So we are not looking at deformation now, okay? We're looking at a body essentially as uh, a, uh, occupying a certain region in space, in three-dimensional space. So everything we will do is going to be in a single configuration and um, because we know that the current configuration always is our uh, spatial configuration, I'm going to label the one configuration in which we're going to study mass transport as omega sub t, okay? The t is not, well, the t is not terribly relevant here because we're not looking at the transformation, at, at, the, at the configuration moving or deforming or changing but just, just for consistency and just for notational purposes, I'm going to call it omega sub t, okay? It's only one configuration, no deformation, no displacement velocities or anything like that to be considered now. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and put that down. So we have our configuration, which, I, which we've decided we're going to call omega sub t. Uh, we are not going to distinguish between reference in current position, but nevertheless, let's just use the notation that we used for current position, x, okay? Uh, so this, this is the setting. And uh, now we're talking of, of, of some substance, right? So we're talking of this, uh, some, sub, some uh, substance with mass. And we want to look at how this substance is transported through the, through the body, okay? So we will denote uh, as our primary variable uh, the concentration. It's the concentration which is defined as number per unit volume. Okay, so we have some substance, we have uh, at, at, at every, uh, in every continuum neighborhood, imagine that we are counting the number of particles of that substance and dividing it by the volume, taking the limit, and that's what the concentration is. Okay, so the concentration will be, will be denoted as C, and this is uh, properly defined as the limit as a Delta V tends to zero, 
okay, of some small number of uh, particles in that, uh, of uh, some, some number of particles in, in a volume, right? So let me, for consistency, let me just denote that as delta n, right? That's sort of the increment of particles that we have in that little uh, neighborhood divided by delta v, okay? Right, so that's the setting we have. So around this point x, we, if we define a neighborhood, we have associated with it a concentration C, which in general can be a function of x and time t. I realize now that perhaps it's best not to refer to the, the configuration as omega sub t. Let's keep it more general by just saying omega. Okay, all right, because the t, uh, the sub t can be confused with actually changing with time and time is going to change in our treatment, okay? So we, we just get, the, get that out of the way. All right, so this is our primary variable, right? The concentration defined as number of uh, particles per unit volume. And, and now let's proceed as we've done before for our other balance laws and try and understand um, how this uh, quantity varies, okay? All right, so what we are trying to look at here is the following. We are going to look at the total number of uh, particles, right, in our volume, in our body. So that will be an integral over omega C dV, okay? And we want to look at how this number changes with time. And that will be ddt of CdV, okay? This is uh, equal to, let's look at w uh, where the changes can come from. So first of all, we could have uh, here a distributed source, okay? So we could have defined throughout this body, throughout this uh, region in space, a source term which I will draw here on the body and uh, following the ideas we introduced in the context of uh, heat conduction, um, this will be defined as a um, source per unit uh, volume. Okay? We'll use pi here, right? Uh, not to be confused with pi, which we used in previous units as uh, our total free energy function on, okay? So pi here is a source term. Okay, so we will write that here, pi, right? Uh, it's a source of, of these particles per unit volume per unit time. So we integrate that over dV, okay? So let's define that. Um, I'm gonna leave myself some room here because I need to write out some more things. So pi is a source uh, defined as number per unit volume per unit time. Okay? And so as you can see, when we integrate pi over the volume, we get back the number, uh, the increment in number of particles uh, per unit time, okay? And then we could also be providing um, a flux of these particles from the surface, all right? Now, um, okay, so let me write that, write it this way. Let me write it as minus integral over uh, the boundary, but now over part of the boundary, I may be actually controlling the flux, okay? And this is the same idea that we saw in the context of heat conduction, right? In the context of heat conduction, we saw that we may be controlling the heat influx over some part of the boundary. Just replace heat with the idea of these particles, okay? So then we are saying that over this part of the boundary that I've just marked out, we are controlling the number of particles entering per uh, unit time. 
Okay? And um, so let me first denote this part of the boundary as partial omega sub j because that is the notation we are going to be using for flux. Okay? We are going to be using j for flux. Okay. So what we are saying here is that again the surface has a unit normal, unit outward normal which we will denote as n. Okay? And over the surface we are uh, controlling the total amount of uh, the, the, the number of particles entering per unit time over every little unit area. Okay? So uh, you know, uh, going with the ideas that we had before we may denote this as, as, as actually an area vector n d little a. Okay? And what we are saying is that we are controlling the influx of uh, particles <coughs> okay, per unit time. And um, let me just think about this. Is notationally, is that what I want to use? Um, well, let me, let, let me denote it as a j bar. Okay? okay. So what are we doing here? Over this part of the boundary, we are saying that we are providing that amount of uh, j bar is the number of particles entering per unit time, okay, per unit area, okay. And um, let me just think about how I want to define the sign on this. Let, 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 me, let, let me make it a plus for now, okay. So j bar is number of particles entering uh, per unit surface area per unit time. Okay? Now, we take an approach similar to what, what was done in the case of Cauchy's theorem for stresses, right? And, and its analog in the context of heat conduction. What we say is that, well, we, ha we are providing this influx, right, which I'm denoting as J bar. It's a scalar, okay? So J bar belongs to R, okay? It's a scalar, right? Um, we're providing this influx of particles per unit time per unit area dA. Now, we know that that area dA has, a, has an area vector associated with it, okay? So we say that since we have the scalar, we use the scalar and that um, area vector to say that uh, J bar, right, is equal to minus j, a vector, okay? And this is to be thought of as the number flux vector dotted with n, okay? Where now this is a vector, it belongs to R3, is the flux vector. Okay, it is the number of particles per unit area. Okay, so we, we're talking about the number of particles. Let me make this actually perpendicular to the unit area. Okay, per unit time. All right. Okay. Now we have that already. Okay. Um, so what we can say straight away here is that this J bar is equal to minus J dotted with N. Okay, and that minus comes about because n is the unit outward normal. So if j is the flux vector, then minus j dot dn tells us the amount of, uh, tells us the number of particles we're sending in, 
sending into the body per unit time, okay, given the fact that n is the unit outward normal. But j bar, right, the way we define this quantity is that it's the number of particles uh, entering, right? So, so that, that, and that is you know, taken care of by the minus sign. Now, all of this is happening over our uh, so-called uh, flux boundary. What about the rest of it, okay? We know that over the rest of it, something else is going to be controlled. We'll talk pretty soon about what we will control um, over, over the rest of the boundary. In fact, we'll talk about it right now. Um, as a sort of complement of the flux condition, just as we had in the case of heat conduction, we, uh, we talked about how we could control temperature over the, over the complement of the boundary. So here, we control what? What would you say in, in, in the mass transport problem is the complement of the flux? Right? What is, what is, the, what is the, the, the other variable? Think about it for a few seconds. It is the concentration, okay? So over the complement of the flux boundary, we will control the concentration, all right? And we will denote that by saying C equals some C bar, okay, on the, re on the remaining part of the boundary. Now, over that part of the boundary, there can be a flux. In fact, there will be a flux, all right? And now, just as we define, uh, just as we defined or the way we introduced that part of the flux over the flux boundary, we have over the remaining part of the boundary, the complement to the flux boundary, which is now the concentration boundary, we have likewise minus J dot N dA. The difference, as we've seen before in the context of heat conduction, is that over the flux boundary, we are actually controlling the amount of flux entering through J bar. We're not controlling the flux on the, co on the concentration boundary. In fact, we're controlling the concentration. Nevertheless, there is some uh, normal flux, okay, over the boundary. All right, and of course, how much is going or how much is entering or leaving the, the body over this part of the boundary as well, okay? does determine how things are changing inside the body. And that's why this term also needs to be included. Okay, so now if we put all of that together, what we arrive at is on the right-hand side, we get integral over omega pi dv plus, now an integral over the entire boundary, okay, minus j dot n dA, okay? As before, as we've done in the context of uh, the mechanics problem or the heat conduction problem, we are saying that the total boundary, that the entire boundary partial omega is the union of the flux boundary and the concentration boundary. And to make sure that we pick up uh, every, every part, every, every point on the boundary, we, we, we take the closure of that union. And furthermore, we also say that those two boundary subsets are disjoint. So we say that this intersection is the empty set. Okay, this is actually a good place to stop uh, with this segment. When we come back, we'll develop these ideas further.